And welcome to the Media Path Podcast. I'm Fritz Kroll. I'm Louise Palenker. You know, here at Media Path, we're like American pickers, scrounging through the media crawl space, looking for good finds that will pique your interest and maybe bring you as much joy as, say, finding an SO gas station sign from the 40s under a rusty tractor. We try to do that. And we also love talking to really interesting people about what makes them smart and interesting, like Wayne Fetterman, who is a comedian, an actor, an author, a USC professor of stand-up and comedy history. He's written a book called History of Stand-Up Comedy, From Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, a spectacular book if you're interested in the great American art form that is stand-up comedy. Also, the hilarious Sean Polofsky, a comedian, an improv actor, an actor, a writer, a producer. Currently, she's producing a game show on TV called Funny You Should Ask. She's so funny and so fast, Sean Polofsky. But first, Weez, what do you have for us? Oh, I've been watching TV, Fritz. Good! I recommend that. Um, So despite or maybe because of a total lack of experience in soccer, American football coach Ted Lasso is hired to manage a British soccer-slash-football team. The club's owner may be attempting to sabotage the team she won in a divorce settlement from her ex-husband. But Ted's relentless positivity is balmy tonic, which proves that love is a contagious and effective medicine. In fact, the show itself will heal your pandemic-hardened soul. The series, <laughs> this series is so good, in fact, that the Internet has risen up in protest to its kindness. Why don't you also hate on candy and ponies and It's a Wonderful Life, Internet? Go ahead and do that. I'll be over here watching Ted Lasso. Has anyone seen it? It's just the best. Yes, and it's exploding. Everybody's watching it. Because it's so good. Season two just started. Yeah. Well, we're into it, and now you have to wait every week. We're we're caught up, as they say, in the streaming trade. See, I I just actually caught it on a, a, a plane they, I saw about maybe they only had two episodes available, so they hook you in like that, and then suddenly ah. now you've got to get Apple TV. So planes are your pushers. Yeah. Okay. You know, exactly on paper, that. you would say, okay, an American comedic actor with a staff of British actors, I don't know. How it's that completely is international, it's fantastic. though. fantastic. Because it's soccer. They come from all over the world. No, I know. But and, that's why it's funny, because it's international. And I don't care about soccer. But and it's also reason. why it's like a hug. There it is. All right, I have a book here. It's called American Dirt. It's a best-selling novel by Janine Cummins. This is the story of Lydia Perez and her son, Luca. They are middle-class Mexicans living in Acapulco. Lydia owns a bookstore. Her husband, Sebastian, is a fairly famous print journalist in Mexico. The story starts with a murder of 16 people in Lydia's backyard, including her husband, And most of her family. The perpetrators are a rising cartel in the area called Los Jardineros, the gardeners. And they're named that way for the brutal way they kill people with gardening implements. It's a comedy. It is a comedy. It isn't a comedy, but it's fantastic. It really is. I should have said that ahead of time. So it was this also Jason Sudeikis? (laughs) No. Okay. I'm I'm not following. I'm not following. I'm not following. following. Okay. (laughs) The... The only survivors of this massacre are Lydia and her son, Luca. There are lines drawn between the murders and a customer at Lydia's bookstore with whom she has an intimate yet platonic relationship. The story unfolds as Lydia and Luca begin their escape across Mexico because she's convinced that the cartel will be coming for her and her son next. It's the story of Mexican cartels, the constant fear expressed by citizens of Mexico because of the cartels. It's about illegal immigration. It's over the last several years, is one of the main topics of political conversation. It's really good. And we've talked about immigration on our side of the border a lot with the left for the last four years. Well, this is the reverse. It got glowing reviews by Oprah Winfrey and Stephen King. It's been optioned for a movie by the same people that did The Mule with Clint Eastwood. It's a really controversial book. Some Latinx writers and critics think it's an anglicized cartoon about the immigration oh. world. Except Cummins even had part of her book tour canceled because of the threats to her safety. I found it to be a gripping read. And for somebody who doesn't know anything about that life, it was a great exposure to this dark world that Mexicans live with every day. I think that maybe the controversy is that the, the author is white and that she begins her book uh, like it's she's a cozy— She's half Puerto Rican, though. But she begins her book like it's a cozy mystery. Yeah. And then— Did you read it? No. 
But from what you were telling, as soon as a bookstore is involved in garden implements, then oh, yeah. Well, part of the I criticism was <laughs> that it misrepresents who the migrants are, because this is a middle class Mexican family and they have good money. It's not about poverty. It's just about the politics of the cartels. And it's about this trip. They talk about La Bestia, which is the beast, which is this train that people take their lives in their hands to jump on, to ride from Guatemala up to the United States to escape the awful circumstances. It's fantastic, particularly if you don't know anything about that life. It might not be, you know, straight down the line accurate for everybody that knows everything about the history of Mexico. I just found it interesting. I don't think it matters what the book is or what the piece of work is. It's never completely accurate or completely satisfying to everybody. You know, not everyone is satisfied with our extrication from Afghanistan, but it's something that that we're doing and you know you can't it, you know that's a weird political uh <laughs> analogy so analogous it. Yeah. no it. it just means that you can't make everyone happy right no I, that's but what you was. learned something and you and you found the book I, I i i thought it was beautifully written i it, it was gripping i i love the relationship between the mother and the son and i i i you know the the tension of these people trying to get across mexico uh, was something that i hadn't considered before and that's that goes on every day you know it's the caravan they said was coming up to take us over yeah, so, so it was good and now we have the tension of people trying to leave Afghanistan, billions of stories are going to come mm -hmm. out of that, I'm quite sure. I think it's my turn to tell go. about something. Okay, so let's see, what should I... All right, here we go. So there's this book called The History of Stand-Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle by a Wayne Fetterman. Mm -hmm. uh, the History of Stand-Up chronicles the evolution of this American art form from its earliest pre-vaudeville practitioners like Artemis Ward and Mark Twain to the present-day comedians of HBO and Netflix like Sean Polofsky. Drawing on his acclaimed History of Stand-Up podcast and popular university lectures, veteran comedian and adjunct USC professor Wayne Fetterman yep. guides us on this fascinating journey. Wayne is a wonderful writer and this book reads like a story told by a wise and fascinating friend. I devoured it. I'm a history nerd and the history of the topics about which I am most obsessed is especially delightful to me. Thank you for this book, Wayne. Wow. Hey. That's great. Don't, don't Ridiculous. talk to me. give you your proper introduction. No. We're going to build toward it. I'm sorry. But there's sorry. a podcast and a book, and it was yeah. fun to read the book first and then listen to the podcast where he plays excerpts. It's like a highly, it's not like some kind of like low rent show like ours where people are just, you know, yakking. It's, he's got elements and you can hear some of the comedians and some of the shows that he's talking about. I just heard him on with Larry Wilmore, who's not as much of a comedy historian as you are, but he's as enthusiastic about the art form. And it was so much fun to listen to you guys heighten each other's, you know, uh, energy. About you. Like, you can't talk yet. No, we're, we're gonna, we have to compliment the crap out of you and then you can come in and, all right. And contest all right. it. That... All right. Here's one that's sort of, uh, it's like being an adjunct professor. It's between defunct and adjacent. Is that what adjunct means? Oh, okay, Kenneth. Yes. But he was part of one of these HBO or uh, uh, <laughs> CNN documentaries, which I just love. I think some of the best work on CNN, other than their breaking news coverage, is the documentary series like the History of Movies, History of TV, History of Late Night, which uh, Wayne makes an appearance on, and this one, the History of Sitcoms. I love this. It's an eight-part series, starting with the development of the sitcom of the 50s to the present. There are 180 interviews with known and loved sitcom folks, Norman Lear and Tina Fey and Tracy Morgan and Lisa Kudrow, Jason Alexander and Ted Danson and Jimmy Walker, lots of people. It puts the sitcom into historical context, which is kind of what Wayne's book does about stand-up. Mm -hmm. It shows us what the sitcoms of a certain era say about American culture during that same era and what happens to the sitcom writing when the culture shifts. There are episodes about sex in the sitcom, friends in the sitcom, families in the sitcom, the workplace in the sitcom. The last episode is aired on CNN, but it's streaming now on CNN Go. If you missed it, I highly recommend it. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to, you guys Maybe you want to go take a smoke break. We're going to talk about The Bachelor in Paradise. Well, The Bachelor franchise in general, I think that Sean and I are maybe students of this genre. Students. We'll call it reality dating. You may call it reality lust. You may call it whatever you wish. You may leave the room and wait until it's over. Uh, you could hide under the couch. There's lots of options. But, but why would you? It's absolutely <laughs> enchanting. And captivating to watch people either pretend to fall in love. Are they pretending to fall in love, Sean, or are they falling? They're falling in love. In love. Okay. You, you're not buying this, Wheezy. Uh, we're all I... invested. How many years you? Do you know the Bachelor has been on twenty years? 
22-0. But how do you get someone to fall so deeply in love that they throw a cake into a fire? Well, <laughs> that's passion. First of all, isn't, isn't she Latina, that girl? Marina. Is that what we're talking about? She was, have, she was like Miss Puerto Rico. She's beautiful. She's stunning. So you're saying she's fire? I'd say she's a fiery woman. I All mean, right. she's a full-fledged, beautiful, fiery woman. And so she feels passion about the guy that she's with. And when she told White and now... I'm, so you should back it up a moment because they're fighting over a guy. Well, no. First of all, we're talking about Bachelor in Paradise, which is very important to know. There are... There are two different types of segments of The Bachelor. There's The Bachelor, and there's also The Bachelorette, where there's one bachelor, there's one bachelorette, and then there's 30-something people that all fight to be with this one person. And then the producers got really, really smart, and they started something that's even better than The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, Mm -hmm. and it's Bachelor in Paradise, where they take previous Bachelor and Bachelorette contestants that didn't quite make the cut or got kicked off the first night. Nobody wanted them. They never got a rose. And then they take them and they put them on an an, an island in Puerto Vallarta, which is literally a 20, uh, maybe a 20-minute boat ride from the main island. So you, too, can go to this place and interrupt the whole filming, which I tried. So um, (laughs) not ashamed to say that that out loud. Um, and it's so it's so fun to see all these people all fall in love. And people really have gotten married off these series, not just The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And yes, not all of them work, but a lot of them have. And Bachelor in Paradise has married off quite a few people. People have had babies from it. So it's a thing. People love love. That is international. And if you don't love love, then get out of here because that that's why we watch this. We watch it because it's just it's the same plot every season. As soon as someone looks at the camera and says, Cynthia and I are completely solid. We've fallen in love. Mm -hmm. We're going to leave here with (laughs) rings on our fingers. The next thing you know, someone's coming down the steps who Cynthia also has a crush on. Yes. So before and it's the same every season, Sean, and we're just as drawn to it. There's no new plot twists. But you know what? That's because we expect it and we love it and we embrace it. Have you stopped watching? Never. No, never. What I've noticed this year is producers have run out of things to say. So the clips that they give, you know, when they interview some of the, the people on the island. Now this year, everybody has the same. Like they all turn around and they're like, well... Mara's very upset. I'd have to say, a Mora storm is a coming. Like now, it's something is a, a storm. Like just because they're on an island, it's a Mora tsunami is a coming. A Mora hurricane. Like that's all. Like that's their only bit that they they can seem to offer. No, but then they like to have where there's drama or something. You know, someone's gonna steal, someone's mad, and then they cut away to like a bird eating a crab. Yeah. Well, the crabs have always been part of a bachelor in paradise because apparently when you go to this island, which, by the way, they do not sleep on this island overnight in this place. It looks like this big villa with bunk beds and everybody has their own makeup mirror to get ready outside with no air conditioning. So they aren't staying there. I know for a fact that they stay at that place where they always take them to for date nights. That's where they all stay. So they get to go indoors at the end of the night. Yes, they boat them there and then... Then they take them back to air okay. conditioning. So, Sean, how do you feel about the revolving hosts and the drama with Chris Harrison? Okay. Um, the whole Chris Harrison thing, he shot himself in the foot. So, uh, apparently, if you didn't know the drama with this, there was on a previous Bachelor, there was an African-American Bachelor, the first one ever. And it was such a big deal. Oh, my gosh. And this guy was, you know, this big hunk and all the girls were fighting for him. And this one girl that he narrowed it down to that he had chosen, uh, I I think they had done some research like right after, I guess, he had chosen her. And they had found out that she had attended a, uh, what was the party called? A plantation party. Yeah, it was like like in the South. Because she probably went to Old Miss and all the freshmen get dolled up in like, you know, antebellum garb and go to these plantation Yeah, like sorority, fraternity, it's all BS. Like that's an okay thing to do. But it's such a cultural thing and you would need to teach the child at age eight, like when you go to college, 
don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. It's extremely racist. But yeah. no, they're never taught that. So they yeah. just get dressed up and they go to a ball. Yeah. And they don't, don't do know that. what they're doing. Don't do that. And the elephant walk. Just um, don't. Don't you gotta do those avoid things. those things. Yeah. You don't know what the elephant walk is? Come on, Wayne. No? Do you, Fritz? No, no. Do you? Did I just? Is I anyone you here make know what trunk, I'm talking about? You make a trunk with your hands. <laughs> no. No. What, did I just? Nobody break? knows what this is. Is it like the Walk of Shame? No. Where you carry it's your like high heels. When fraternities. And... Wait, is it when you don't forget? No, it's when. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's when the fraternities. It's a hazing process. Oh, okay. Where guys will uh, take their privates and the other guy has to hold their privates with their hand below and they have to walk around like they're holding an elephant. Anyways, it, it's an old school thing. I never did the elephant walk because, well, mine's not that big, but it's a, it's a whole thing. But And it, when filmed, it can ruin careers. Great. So can we get so, back to the antebellum party? Yeah. Anyways. So she goes to this antebellum party and then... And it's confusing because there's two people named Rachel in this story. Yes. So, so it yeah. got it leaked out that there were pictures of her at this, and then uh, either there was a whore, there was a whore, there was well, there was those two. There was a whole uproar about this on social media, and so one of the previous bachelorettes, who was the first African American bachelorette, was interviewing Chris Harrison. It was on E. It was on. It was on a major. T- I can't remember which TV show it was, and she'd asked him how he felt about that, and he actually defended Rachel, the girl in the pictures, and just said, "Come on, it was 2018 when this happened, and it was like, er, er, screech." So he tried. He was mansplaining and race splaining, and it was not a good look. And he knew that she was the one that Matt picked, so he's just trying to like rewrite her story so that it's palatable but it wasn't going down no it did and it did not bode well therefore he's no longer the host of bachelor nation and bachelor nation lost their shit they were not happy about it and yet what was even crazier here comes bachelor in paradise and you you know you always look forward to seeing chris harrison and now they replaced him First, it starts off with David Spade. And I'm just going to say right now, no one should be putting David Spade amongst a bunch of 20-something-year-old women. I was so women. worried for them. I was so, I do feel like, yeah, I, I, I it's definitely. It's good for David Spade, though. <laughs> it's <laughs> good for David Spade. There was a total, and I'm not going to lie, like I felt when uh, Demi came out, who looks this girl has been on previous uh, Bachelor in Paradise, and she's kind of always the troublemaker. Well, on her oldest day, she may look 14. She looks about 15. And David Spade's face lit up like a tree, like a Christmas tree. And it was like, it was uncomfortable. It was like almost uncomfortable. Yeah, he was, and he was like, hello, Debbie. To see her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, she looked like a pork chop to David Spade. So I was like, we got to get Demi out of here. They, we got to protect her. So they have revolving hosts. So the next week it's Lance Bass, so she's <laughs> safe. She's Which, you know, okay. I was He's going to be about, okay. Right. We love our Lance. Yeah. I mean, like, no one's going to be uncomfortable with Lance Bass. No, like, he's going to sit down with everybody, and he can have a one-on-one with the girls. And that's, like, you feel comfortable about that. Who else are going to be the—I guess they're rotating the host, so who else is coming? Um, it looks like— Wink uh, Martindale is the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Just came over the wire. Definitely. The wire. The wire. The wire. Definitely. Because that's How the technology they have on this beach. They have a wire. They have a wire. Just came over the wire. Yeah, it's definitely uh, Wink Martindale. So we recommend The Bachelor in Paradise if you love love and if you love crabs crawling across beaches. It's just it's well, got it all. And it's drama. And they know they know how to light the fire. They and, do. and you you buy and, it and, and throw like, a cake into it. Like my, my, my husband is a Latino and uh, he and I, we both we love love. Like this is why I married this man. We can watch any of these reality love shows all day long. I don't care what it is. But Bachelor, Bachelor in Paradise, we. You got to be invested. You watch with your husband. No, he does not really enjoy this type of programming. He likes things exploding and people being tortured. And he plays it very loud. Uh-huh. <laughs> Have you not seen Fauda? Uh-huh. So, yeah, he likes things that, like, uh, uh, yeah. But My- we find things, we both like Ted Lasso. We find things that we watch together. Yeah. But I can't get, like, I'm obsessed with Big Brother. And I, I'll tell him the plots of Big Brother, and he finds that really intriguing. But he doesn't really want to sit there and, and watch it. it. 
makes yeah. him kind of gag. I can get my husband into any reality TV show except any of the Real Housewives. Yeah. That's when he shuts down. Once mm-hmm. in a while, he'll Gets pick his head. like I do. Yeah. And, and I just want to go through the television yeah. and start slapping. And yeah, I, I can't. Uh, those people create drama out of nothing. There's no contest. No one wins. So I'm not invested. So, Fritz, I think you should introduce Wayne. I can't he, wait to He hear was on the first season of The Bachelorette. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, our guest uh, w- was actually interviewed. We were talking about the history of whatever shows on CNN. He was uh, interviewed in the one that aired in May called The History of Late Night on uh, CNN. He's an adjunct professor of stand-up comedy and comedy history at USC. That's the University of Southern California Fight here on. in the United States. A comedian, an actor, an author who wrote The History of Stand-Up, which we will discuss. He wrote also... And this is interesting because I don't know anything about basketball. He wrote a, a, a book about Pistol Pete Maravich, who was an iconic NBA player. He's a writer, a comedy historian, a musician. He went to NYU, studied acting with Stella Adler. This dude, he's way overqualified to be on this podcast. I mean, he had a one-person show in New York City. Wow. He started comedy in the <laughs> New York clubs, came to L.A. in the late 80s, did The Tonight Show, did a half-hour special on Comedy Central, played Larry Sanders' brother on The Larry Sanders Show. He's done films, he's done commercials, <laughs> and he's going to reenact a couple of them for us. Yep. In 2009, he went to New York to help launch Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. He was Fallon's first head monologue writer. Written for the Golden Globes, the SAG Awards, the DGA Awards. Mm -hmm. And here's a show I can't wait to talk about. He produced, along with Judd Apatow, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling on HBO. And in March, dropped his book called The History of Stand-Up Comedy from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, Wayne Fetterman. Yay. That was incredible. Thank you. Now, we don't have any more time, but, you know, be sure to read (laughs) it. So, before, I, I just want to say that I was so affected by the Gary Shandling documentary. Proud of you and proud of Judd. I sent Judd an email. I said, I know you're Mr. 40-year-old version and Mr. Anchorman, but this is probably the best piece of work you've ever done. He said, the response I've gotten to this reflects that. He said, I can't believe the response we got to that. I think every starting stand-up comedian should be forced to watch that. It was so human. And Gary was so smart and zen and thoughtful. It was really wonderful. It was a great piece of work. Yeah, that's more, that's Judd. I mean, I was just. No, I know, but yeah, you yeah, were part yeah. of that project and I'm sure. You a little bit, yeah, but yeah, that was, that was incredible. That was one of those, sometimes projects have that like angel dust or whatever that's sprinkled and that's what that was. It was just a, he was the perfect guy to do it. Gary does didn't have I hate to say this like a wife or kids or anyone trying to protect his legacy so it was like we could be as honest as we wanted and I, I was just thrilled to be part of it thank you but you did have his writing he had his diaries oh yeah 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 These things that yeah. look like hieroglyphics I remember he used to go to the clubs and bring that <laughs> yeah, with the legal that, right? paper yeah. and he'd have the same one over his whole stand up com- uh, career <laughs> and nobody could read it but him it was all it was very jittery. scribbly very scribbly. anyway that was a great piece of did work. you did you know Gary did I yeah. oh yeah. yeah 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 I mean he was besides on the Larry Sanders show. besides playing Stan Sanders I also was he had a weekly basketball game at his house and I was part of that for 20 years and he I don't know it's just weird he took a liking to me I don't know why and well, so I can see that but he he was just great you know just great and I was thrilled to be his friend and but it was always I was always a little like oh it was just Gary Shantley. <laughs> you know what I mean it was, yeah. it was a, it, I don't think it was like a but was, was there great. a feeling of being able to honor him that was that satisfying? With that documentary? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just surprised that many people were into it because yeah. younger comedians barely know him. Barely. Because his that show was never in syndication. Neither one of the, you know, so it's like it's sort of like already a niche thing. So... But in the history of sitcoms and things that oh, yeah, spun yeah. off out of sitcoms, it's it's legendary. As was his Showtime show. It's Gary oh, you remember Shandler's that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But he was so creative. Yeah. So w- w- was it at the Comedy and Magic Club? Where did you where did you do sets I, with them? I I, I I I did sets with him everywhere. Wherever he would come in with his bad piece of paper. <laughs> but uh, the first time I saw him, and yeah. and this almost made me quit comedy. Oh wow. Um, I, I, I came from Buffalo, New York, where Wheezy lived, and I this was at the time when in order to succeed— I kicked succeed, him out. See, 
in order to succeed, you had to work at the comedy store. It was right. like, you know, it, yeah. it was like the mountain of mud in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You, you had to go there. And so I, I came to California. I had nowhere to stay. I stayed in the, uh, on the floor in a sleeping bag of a woman I had done some commercials with. And I went down to the comedy store my first night here. I'd never been there. What, what year kind of is this? Just 1980. Like... Okay, okay, keep going. So, um, and I, I had started comedy in Buffalo, New York. I, I, uh, we had our own comedy night at a jazz club. And I was... I thought, well, I'm ready for the big time. I've got a solid 10 minutes. I'm ready to go. I'm, 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 I'm way right, ready right, to right, go. Right. And I got out, and on stage at the Comedy Store was Gary Shandling, uh-huh. uh, was uh, Jimmy J.J. Walker. I knew you were going to say that. The cl- <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's, always, always there. it's always Jimmy J.J. <laughs> J. J. Walker. <laughs> but, uh, and, and the closer was Charles Fleischer, right, right. who may be one of the great undiscovered geniuses of stand-up. And uh, and Billy Crystal was doing his uh, Muhammad Ali thing. And Shandling was getting ready for his first Tonight Show. And after I watched two and a half hours of just mind-blowing talent, mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to hitchhike back to Buffalo. I am so unqualified to be in this town with these acts because... I had no idea how good everybody what was. What kept you in? What kept you here? I said I'm going to stay. I, I sold an insurance policy to come out here, and I said to myself, I will stay until my money's gone, and then I will go home and apologize. Well, I don't understand that insurance policy. What does that mean? You, I don't know if you can do it now, but in the, I had an insurance policy. Does that anyone called, know what that means? Yes. Maybe that's like you there's a penalty. You no, sold an insurance. I think policy. I need one soon. The penalty though. for <laughs> early withdrawal, and you take the penalty for the early withdrawal, and you take the early withdrawal. Yeah, you right. can sell insurance policy back to the company, and they'll. But well, how did you have an insurance policy? Well, because I was trying to be conscientious about being a human, and I wanted to insure myself. And if I died, then you know, who was going to get? Who was going to be the beneficiary? I don't know. Yeah, this is this is the important part I'm of the sorry, story. His friend Pete. Is that what you're driving at? That I didn't. That I didn't. Did I, you have no, a family? I, or, yes. Yes. I'm not the oh, one interrogating okay, okay. you about the insurance policy. No, you are. It's no but the way you said it was like I. If you said. I sold my pickup truck that I grew up <laughs> no. with. They came to live a dream. No. I'd be like, okay, I understand I, that. I, I, I sold an insurance I, you, you, policy. I don't know if it, I, it, one of those term insurance things. So if you don't go through the, the whole term. Is, was it a life you insurance? Could sell it. Yes, yes, life insurance. I got it. Got it was it. only worth like $7,000. You know, which is a bad reflection on the quality of my life, but, uh, but I, I just love it. I'm fascinated I by it. So I got out here, yeah, and I thought with your insurance th- money. Listen to the, that's that's what it was, <laughs> and I thought to myself, seven thousand dollars, I'll be able to live for a right, year right, on seven. Know, yeah. And I got out to California, and I lived a month with seven thousand dollars. The first and last in an apartment, and then food. Mm-hmm. I, I was broke, so I got out here, and. Uh, and I went to the comedy store, and Shanley was on stage, and he hadn't done Tonight Shows yet, so I wasn't aware of his skill. He was a great writer, and I, he just sucked the life out of me. I felt so unqualified to be out here. So, but then I got to know him, and you know, anyway, that was a great piece of work. Did um, you have like a moment after that where you were like, where you got on stage either there or at some other club, and you were like? Yeah, maybe I can make this happen. No, I would get on stage and I couldn't stand <laughs> the sound of my own voice. Didn't like my own material, what? so I just did. I did open mic nights. Where for two at, at the comedy store, at the store where you go sign up at two yeah. o'clock in the afternoon yeah. and you go back on a Monday night mm-hmm. and there are a thousand people. There are many with uh, borderline personality of disorder. Yeah, and they're still there. Yes. Yeah, and it I, does draw those type of people. You could up. only go through that once in your life. That whole scene. It's yeah. so depressing. And I just did it, and it was just dogged determination. And then she made me a paid regular, and I started getting. Well, what about that night when she like said that to you? Was that a thing? I didn't trust it. She was too nice to me. I I didn't trust that 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 I had talent. I said, "Wait, this can't be right." It's interesting. So no, no, I you know I I I wasn't completely deflated, but I just remember the first night I got here, seeing Shanley and seeing these right right guys who were at the top of their game, and I thought, "What have I done? What made me think I could ever come out here?" You thought maybe you needed to get a catchphrase like (laughs) "Dino (laughs) Mine." Well, I'll say this about the comedy store: I I I was made a paid regular and i couldn't hack it now sean is a female right she was made apparently and she so i've heard she's a lot more talented than me i think i knew that i wasn't 
good enough to like to be able to sustain life amongst all these bullies. How did you do it well, as a that's woman? That's a good question. How do I still do it as a woman? Yeah. Is because that is my home club. That is the that is the place I love to work the most. And that's really I find to be out of any comedy club. And I haven't performed at every comedy club in the world, but I find that place to be the number one war zone. And if you can't get good in there, then you can't get good anywhere. And that's and, what happened to me. So I'm not any good at stand up comedy. But I but I was fortunate. I didn't you got have caught to. in some bad sexual politics in there. I think that well, Sean can speak to this because there there's a type of woman that that can own her space on stage and know that she deserves it and that mm -hmm. she's earned it. And I'm not her. I'm more I'm more of a like a writer, kind of a like a a mellow per like I'm like Wayne, but I, they don't go after Wayne. It, because he's a man. Right. So if, if a woman is like that and you're not sleeping with someone, you're just taking up their stage time and not giving them anything that they want. And they're horrible. Uh, that's what I experienced. But Sean No, I'm is sure it was. A, yeah. The way you describe it is a war zone. Would, did you have that same experience? Honestly, I, I you know, I started doing some shows, some uh outside shows in the belly room uh -huh. and I got recommended by someone to uh, showcase in front of Mitzi Shore. I was very lucky. Lucky. I never did the open mic nights Good. at the comedy store. I showcased, not only did I not showcase at the Los Angeles comedy store, and usually when you're showcasing there, as we've all know, usually Mitzi is sitting in the back in this one chair. And what happens is when you get up there to do three minutes on stage on a Sunday night to showcase for her, other comedians come out like roaches to cock block you yep. to keep you from getting past. And so I had been witness to that. I had seen it. And I was lucky enough that at the time when I came on, Mitzi was work was looking for more women to put in the belly room to get the energy back because, it you know, the comedy store is haunted. And when that room was right and not possessed, it had a bunch of women <laughs> in it. So she was trying to bring a women's show back in there. Women scare away ghosts. Yes, it's exactly. Proven. You know it. And so especially Jewish women, we scare the <laughs> shit out of them. <laughs> so she brought she, you know, I showcased I got to showcase in La Jolla. Oh, yeah. Right. And I got to do one of the first road clubs in the history of stand up. Yes. It's in your book with uh, a condominium that. Yes. that was no was not yet. Well, I'm not like, talking about that club, but yes, that coated was one in of the body first, fluids. Yes, yep. that's one of the first. Yeah. And La so I was I was fortunate. I got to showcase the La Jolla Comedy Store. I didn't get three minutes. I got ten. Mm -hmm. And then I went your on entire, stage. Your entire act. Ten yeah. Minutes. No, seriously. That's ten it. minutes. And I was told if she likes you. And her so, daughter was running the La Jolla Comedy Store at the time. Yeah, right? I didn't see her there that night. It was mm -hmm. just Mitzi in the back. The room was half filled. It was mm -hmm. quiet. Oh, I, she was down there. Mm. I brought some friends. Yeah. And um, after you were done, they people told me she'll either pull you aside or she will ignore you. Just move on. And so I was done with my ten minutes. And then she... You know, I came towards the back and she she called me over. And because I did like a Barbara Streisand impression or whatever, and she pulled me aside and she goes, Barbara, <laughs> you're very funny. Call in Monday. And that was wow. it. And so that's how I, and right. so I kind of I was lucky enough to, you know, surpass anything that, you know, most people went through. Right. Trying to get into the comedy store. OK, so tell one joke. From the night you got passed, and then when you tell one joke from the night you got passed. Oh, God. Um, I know I'm trying to think, too. While you're thinking, yeah. do you think Mitzi was um, biased against female comics for the first part of the history of the comedy store? I tried to get Elaine Boozler to talk about this, and she wouldn't talk Is about it. Is that because of the documentary you watched? Or no, is that just because in general what, 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 what you felt? But didn't she create the belly room specifically? Yeah, for girl, but that seems so... Yeah, like, that to separate the women. Like, yeah, and she would never oh, give a anybody uh, a, a main... Uh, what no about that... I don't know her name. That Japanese, it seemed like she. Uh, Asuko, yeah, is it yeah, a, like yeah. a. Yeah, it seemed like you really championed her quite yeah. a bit. Th this is pre that. This oh, is it is. Way, okay. This yeah. is okay. okay. The early 80s when, when you know, people like. Well, Elaine Boozler had no problem because she was already. Had, she was, yeah. she, she was uh, established before she got out here. So she, like you, didn't have to go through the whole vetting process. Well, my theory is that Mitzi claimed to champion women, but she actually liked having all of the male energy focused on her. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. I agree with that. I agree with that. But I think she did. There was definitely Louise Duart and all of those women were yeah. part yes. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think it did what you're saying. And someone asked me that question because they had kind of, wit- you know, had watched documentaries and was like, it seemed like just from observing and hearing about it that that was what she was it seemed like it was male friendly and that the women were put up in the yeah. belly room you at had first. Carrie Snow, you had a lot mm-hmm. of people who really were skilled comedians that never got original or main room spots. And it seemed I, it, to me, although again, Elaine wouldn't commit to this. She was very diplomatic. Well, I, 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 Wait, when were you speaking to her about her? She, about two months ago. Right three, here? Three, yeah. yeah. Oh, in this seat or the. Well, she was, she she was, was on, over on there Zoom. on Zoom. Oh, oh okay. She, she didn't okay. want to leave her house. She's I like, understand. She's like, I'm afraid to leave my house. Two weeks later, she's in Europe on Facebook. Because <laughs> <laughs> she got over that. You couldn't come what over to pandemic. a podcast. Or you can go to Italy. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, okay, no, well, I mean, I, I'm very grateful. If it wasn't for Mitzi Shore, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right, today. Right. I wouldn't mm-hmm. be working in this business. She was the one that gave me the chance that gave me the platform. It was male comedy owners that really weren't seeing it, that weren't giving me that opportunity. And it was Mitzi that really mentored me. And to this day, I mean, I, I, I am one of the very few people and she used to live down the street from me. And so I would go and visit her and, and um, Jeff Scott, who may rest in peace, who uh, was the piano player of the comedy store for 25 years. Uh, the Shores let Jeff and I see her like uh, probably about four days before she passed. Oh, wow. And so we came in and we sat down with her and she couldn't really speak. She couldn't speak at the time, but she was there and present and she could still listen in here. And so I sat down with her and just kind of spilled my guts with everything that I wanted to say to her. And then I would answer as her, you know, yeah, answer you back. Do like, a, you do it Bar- well. You know, Barbara, are you done yet? I'm hungry. <laughs> You're going on and on. I don't care anymore. You know, and I'm like, oh, Mitzi, it's funny that you're thinking that. And, but uh, now, I appreciate, listen, yeah. you had to work there. And when you got passed to be a paid regular at the store, it was like graduating from college. Now, it for was, me... She well, would put my name on the list, and the men wouldn't type it up. Yeah. They would erase my name and I know, not tell me you, that I had a spot, oh and then God. Mitzi would see, would think that I was a no-show. When it you was, first got passed, it was, a, it was a point of pride, though. It was, but I just couldn't. I could not tough it out. I was, okay. It was making me worse as a comedian. It was uh-huh. deflating my confidence. It's definitely a very dark place, you and never, I think you if you can the store survive much, it. Right? No, you, I was you more of an improv, improv guy. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's right. That was my. But at, when I got out here, which was a little later in, like, mm-hmm. 87, mm-hmm. There was like a division, like you were either working at the improv or the store. And they would have spies to see who was doing spies. Yeah, and I didn't want to be part of any of that, so I just was just like, I'll just, he's putting me up, I'll just do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I've done spots those over the years, but I've never, I was, you never passed me or, I only met her. she never passed you? I only met her a couple times, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Well, she didn't pass Seinfeld either. So right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, it took her a while to pass Gary Shandling. Wasn't it like nine showcases? yeah, yeah. But she, you know, look, that's that club is amazing. But can we go back to Elaine Boozler a little bit? Because yes, I write yes. about her in the book. Yeah. Because she was so important mm-hmm. as a comedian, yeah. and especially the way, you know, she started. She was a waitress at the Improv in New York, mm-hmm. and like uh, there was other com- Andy Kaufman, and you know, not only liked her, but it was like, I think you could do this. And then so she, I I don't know, and I don't know if you know this, like those specials she did, like. Five specials for yeah. Showtime yeah. in and like a three-year period or yeah. something. She yeah. had to pay for them herself. Yeah. She, she had a boyfriend at the time who believed in her, but then they they changed. The one on the ship? I'm not sure. The story of her first special is something that she absolutely fought for and did on her own, on oh, her really? own dime. Yeah, because no Showtime, one wanted nobody to give an wanted hour to, do a female to a woman. Hour. From yeah. a man's point of well, view, they did, they did old why summer. would I want to listen to a woman talk for an hour? I already get that at home with my wife. Like <laughs> men just were not understanding why anyone would watch this, not grasping that maybe half of the people in the world are what, women who might want to hear right. a woman talk about the things that matter to her. So well, she one, is on the first c- young comedian special. Yes. It wasn't called yes. Young Comedians. It was called Freddie Prinze and Friends. Yeah. She is on. She's the only female on that. So had she done her? Had her special aired? No, by then? this is that seventy six. Oh, okay. wow. That's way early. Yeah, they were going to call it Freddie Prince and One Lady. And yeah, <laughs> like, so Pink I have a question for you, Wayne. About yes, anything. It's, it's the, one of the first thesis of your book. Like yes. at the very beginning of your of your book, 
you say that comedy doesn't age well. That's true. But that current comedians stand up doesn't age well. Right. That yeah. stand up doesn't age well. But that current comedians are tremendously influenced by those they follow. So aged comedy is an inside taste. No, 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 no. I'm saying comedian style is influenced by comedians you see. So you're right. like, oh, I see Shanley doing this. I, I want to adapt that. I don't know if there was any comedians you saw that influenced you or oh, yeah. your style or like how you wanted to do I think all the it. New York guys, the comic strip and the catch guys, mm -hmm. like Paul Reiser, Larry Miller, and mm -hmm. Seinfeld all studied Robert Klein. This is a perfect the, example. That's mm -hmm. a perfect, yeah. But is it the jokes themselves? That no. no, it's delivery. Which it's, part, the, it's the New no, York but Which cadence. part doesn't age well? Which part? The topics. Stand up, yeah, the topics. The In topics. other words, yeah, yeah. Oh, all of it. And the, the topics, the style, the... And especially the jargon, mm -hmm. like just how you're saying a joke can immediately age you. And you're like, oh, they, they can smell it. I remember when I started the comic strip, like those uh, Catskill guys would come down and they were just like, well, they're not even getting this vibe at all. And I'm sure in the Catskills, they're like, oh, these guys at the comic strip or, you know, a catch or rise star don't know what they're doing. So it's always like in a, this evolving story. That's why. So many older comedians that were named Jack. There was a lot of them named Jackie and Hecky and <laughs> Checky. And you know what I mean? They all had this. They all had a specific kind of style. A rhythm. And that, as soon as Robert Klein came along and Carlin. It was more of a jazz rhythm. That seemed different. Yeah. Even, let's talk about Lenny Bruce. Okay. Even if you listen to Lenny Bruce, it's hard to even get in because he's like this kind of hipster, you know, bebop beat guy using a lot of jazz and throws in Yiddishism. So it's even hard to even get into kind of what he's sort of doing. Mm -hmm. So And he started as a Catskills type direct stand up before he, he was an impressionist. Yeah. yeah, he was an impressionist. But yeah. the gist of your book is that comedy uh -oh. is this energy and whatever the pipelines are that open, yeah. whether it's radio or television mm -hmm. or the internet or podcasts, comedy will rush into it. And adapt. Yep. Yeah, it, that is, but that's, fills, that's one of the thesis. Yeah. yeah, and it fills all those spaces with this kind of wisdom or zeitgeist of whatever matters to us in that moment. And it, it's just it's just fascinating. Do you agree with that? or Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I think it, that's a fascinating premise. And if, if you if you look at the, the grand scheme of comedy, it's always been the truth. It, you know, it's it's wearing a joke, but it's the truth that we need to hear. But Speaking sometimes truth it, to power. But mm -hmm. sometimes the tr it is a truth to power because let's take Rodney, for example. I don't know if he was a truth to power guy or even revealing. You know, I don't think he really wore a pork chop around his neck. But he was talking about insecurity no and everyone can relate to Yeah, him. Yeah, there mm -hmm. was an underlying mm -hmm. thing of like, I can't, nobody likes me, that sort of thing. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. So it's interesting. It's an interesting, yeah. So I, I love the start of your book because I happen to think that Twain... Wow. is the funniest man ever to write on a piece of paper. I, I I mean, if you look at some of his political essays, yeah, yeah. they are as biting as Bill Maher is on a good night. I mean, they he, he was he was really, the way he took after Roosevelt and those guys, unbelievable. And but, the weird thing was that Mitzi didn't pass him. <laughs> <laughs> it was the thing. She, she didn't see it. Do the voice, do the voice. To Mark. I'm sorry, Mark Twain, move on. You're not good enough. Go write something. <laughs> you're a writer. Everyone knows your real thank name you, is thank Sammy. You. But those thank guys, you, thank you. and, uh, you know, uh, they were doing stand-up. They were doing public speaking. As a matter of fact, Twain paid his way out of debt by doing a yeah, global Yeah, 100% right. Oh, he knows the whole story. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No, yeah. But, but, Just like but Willie Nelson. There was, <laughs> right. He, was, he, was, he smoked his way I out think, of debt. <laughs> <laughs> um but there was no voice amplification. They had a thousand people in a room. And how did they do that? Uh, that's one. Well, that's one of the things I do talk about in the book is the introduction of the microphone really revolutionized yeah. stand up comedy. So for those guys that did it before, I don't know. I mean, there's no footage of Mark Twain, obviously, doing there's no recording of his voice. There's some film footage of him at home, you know, at the end of his life. So. I don't know. I guess it was, you know, at the time those theaters were really built acoustically uh, sophisticated. So everything, there was no microphones for anything. There was a comedian named Burt Williams who was a vaudeville star. And I write about him in his book. And as a quote, he said he would, before he did his set, would go out and kind of 
in an empty and stand and find the spot on the stage where his voice would reverberate back to him. And he said he stood on that spot for the entire time like a postage stamp. So I don't. That's a great question. Yeah. So those guys, Artemis Ward and Mark Twain, right? The, 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 and even, even though he wasn't funny, Charles Dickens made a huge amount of money right. doing that's, the lecture circuit. Yep. Yep. But but after that, and you brought up vaudeville, isn't that really where stand up comedy, as we think about it, got honed? They were the host of these vaudeville shows, and they did a little. And I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, asking that was, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mart Saul, Shecky Green. Yeah. All of My guys. mom always used to say right. that. No, before yeah. even all of those guys, the, uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, the, my favorite thing about writing the book was there was a whole bunch of comedians, Frank Tinney, these, Frank Fay, these are guys that are kind of lost to history, but were very influential to the young comedians starting out in vaudeville. And those young comedians, we know Bob Hope, Jack Benny, Milton Berle, they were the young comics like, uh, how do I get into this? What do I do? And so from there, so they influenced them. And you never think of Bob Hope as like a young comic, like trying to figure out even how to do this because he was sort of a song and dance man. So, yeah. So in vaudeville, there was a guy, Frank Vey, terrible mm-hmm. guy, but he used, they started having them MC. I don't know if you've ever seen in vaudeville where they would have like the placard of like, Oh, this is, uh, you know, and the, so there was no introductions. They just put out the card and then the act would go on and then they, the act would leave. And then like, oh, here we go. This is going to be, uh, you know, Nora Baines or something like that. And she's going to sing Shine On Harvest Moon. So the the Palace Theater started using comedians as MCs to sort of tie it all together. Material. Yeah, so that's so so now the guy keeps coming back. He can do a callback to an earlier thing. He can make fun of an act. And it's and, giving the act time to set up and you were talking about like the correlation between vaudeville and then the Ed Sullivan show yeah. and how they would have two or three comedians often on on Sullivan and I'm sure it was the same thing. They had elephants that they had to get into place right, and everything. Right, right. So the com- you know it was a live show. So they put the comedian out there while the they curtain. got every yeah, the plate yeah. spinners set up, and then the curtain would open, and they'd start spinning plates. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. That's the that's the purpose it serves. It's like one. There was a physical purpose but as this, well. This as... act is like it's a person talking. There's nothing lower tech than that, and it probably went on in in the Italy city states, you know, at the palace and whoever right. whoever was paying for entertainment to be a thing. You know, and so as a matter of fact, you bring that up and that's good, Wheezy, because there's a through line in Wayne's book. It's humans standing on a stage trying to get laughs. Right. Right. That's what stand up boils down to. And it's probably always been a thing, whether it was called storytelling or whatever. But I I find uh, the history of of Will Rogers to be interesting because they say that if you want to get a boy to talk like your son or that you should do an activity like roll up paper and toss it into you know, the wastebasket, like Uh do something, don't just sit in front of him. He's not going to talk unless you're taking a walk or driving or doing a thing. And so Will Rogers starts out spinning a rope. Yep. And then I think somehow that activity makes it easier for him to communicate because I think men historically have a difficult time communicating. But if you don't say (laughs) if they're doing something. Well, I don't know if I I'm going to push back on that a little bit because I, I don't know about the kids stuff. Because I'm not really usually trying to get five year olds to talk to me, but <laughs> as a rule, as a rule, I don't know what world you're living in where you're trying <laughs> to get. Uh, but and it just seems like men have been orating and talking. Now they call it mansplaining. As long as I've been alive, and like if I look back in history, there's like guys talking and. But from their heart, that's the thing. Oh, I about feelings. Oh, yeah. yeah. I suggest watch Bachelor in Paradise. Okay, I got to learn about this. I got to learn about the hum- the difference. I mean, yes, men are explaining what they know, of course. But to say what they really feel or think about something is like a little bit oh, like okay. that's what you were saying in, in your book or your podcast. I can't remember which one that you found so fascinating watching the comedians was being able to hear what they thought about things, you know, while they while they told their jokes. Will Rogers is interesting, too. And I don't know where I, I don't know if I read this in your book or I saw it somewhere else. But right. His son said, my father was full of shit because Rogers made his bones 
speaking in the most common terms to the common man. He was a blue-collar comedian, and the aw shucks thing with a hat tilted back. Yeah, yeah. But in real life, he was completely the opposite. He played polo. He only hung around with rich people in Malibu. They. Uh, uh, I'm so disappointed to hear this because there is an airport dedicated to him where I'm from in Oklahoma no, City. Yeah, so no. now, so, I, but, should but, you but, name but, an but airport about, after a guy who dies in a plane crash? But, <laughs> exactly. But... but uh, John Denver Airport coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Skinner runway. <laughs> yeah. But but it's the idea of you have to have a hook, and he discovered this hook, and he and he polished that. But it was completely against what he was in real life, which I thought was very interesting. That is wow. interesting. He found Never a way to market. Well, it. I don't know if that's just like he Trump. Was, that was completely a, a different. He did come up. He worked out of the his poor. way out of that. Yes, he worked. And when oh. he made money, he was like, this right. is what I want to do is play polo and hang yeah. out. With but I, I think his son, because his brother, his son grew up after they had right, money. Right, right, so right. So right, right. So that was a different character. Yeah. No, but Will Rogers is really, really interesting guy. And like you said, started out as a rope guy and then started talking more. And New York audiences loved him. And. And then he became so huge, he was like the first multimedia comedy star because he did silent movies, then he did talking movies, then he did radio, then he had a newspaper uh, column every day, a daily newspaper column. So you could read about him, and he did stand-up tours, and he did tours where he would talk to people. No TikTok? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but, no, but it, 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 I know you're it making was, fun of TikTok. It was their version, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is that. So, And I mean, he had the year of presidents and everything. He was just like top yeah, down. Yeah, I mean, anytime you see, like you said, Bill Maher or Amber Ruffin or anybody doing political comedy, to me, they're all in the shadow of what Will yeah. Rogers did in the 1920s yeah. and 30s. And so I wanna, simple. I, I want to talk for a moment about blackface you know oh, because Jesus. okay That's all right no so you, you know so, this didn't work out for chris harrison so right. tread lightly exactly. and we're all white okay okay I got <laughs> you sure you want to bring this up correctly just... wayne fetterman so, me, i'm balancing on a popular, very thin the, rope right here. the popular i'm like i'm a walenda i'm like okay <laughs> is this really really what you want to do we can, we can record, all, there's eight cameras out here. We can always cut this part out. We're not live. <laughs> so the popularity of minstrel shows and their mysterious appeal. So white people, while systemically preventing the achievement, rights, and privileges of black people, were appropriating their culture. Is it possible that the anonymity of blackface gave Victorian age stiffs the cover that they needed to cut up? I think there is something to that. Yeah. I mean, I... Okay, I don't... <laughs> yes, there is something that... When you put on that makeup, that you were now uh, able to uh, emote in a less, uh, in a less, uh, less Victorian way, I, I guess would be the answer to that. But what's your take on why we wanted? <laughs> we're not done with you yet, Wayne. We're going to get. <laughs> sweating. Don't worry, you'll be canceled by the end yeah, of this podcast, Wayne. I'm Albert it's Brooks good. in broadcast news. If you, if you, if, <laughs> If you're 18 years old in 2021 and you first hear about blackface, you're probably thinking, what the hell? So you're you're putting you're, – you're making fun of black people and their culture, but the whole show is black people and their culture. I, I – Right. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. And part of – if you think of it as – think of a clown, okay? Think okay. of what a clown does. Puts right. on the makeup. White face. And part of the – Part of the idea of putting on the is you're creating a persona that's not you, right? Mm-hmm. So it could be a sad clown, but part of it was also the people uh, 500 yards away from you could see when you're smiling or when you're making the sad face. So it was a very easy way to express emotion with just using a mask. And part of blackface was that, that it was a mask, a theatrical mask used by performers to be able to let them tell jokes or be sad or, you know, that that kind of thing. And it, obviously, I mean, it's horrific to look at now, but it was so popular in the 1800s that it and it really, I'm not going to say it, even music. The Stephen Foster songs and yeah, everything. Exactly, exactly. All of that is like the basis of all of our show business. Yeah, it was white people appropriating black culture. Because they didn't have a lot of their own culture, it was just too boring. So they, you know, wh- uh, black people invented jazz, invented ragtime, invented all that early right, music, right, right. and they invented all these art forms. So I think it's appropriating too. 
I think it is, but also don't forget in vaudeville, ethnic identity was huge part of the comedy. Let me give you an example. The Marx Brothers. Right. Okay? I write about it in the book. Yes, you do. So that's the Marx Brothers. Groucho was a German slash yiddish kind of character, right? Harpo, obviously, Frightwig. It was red in real life, you know, black and white in the movies. That's, that was an Irish character he created. And Chico, we all know, is Italian, right? So they were already- That was like, so I interesting. Just cross I love that. I, I never even considered that. Yeah, but so good. already, so they were like kind of the end of that thing. But if you look back at- there's a famous comedy team called Weber and Fields, and they were two German guys, and they'd have Irish guys, and they'd have Scottish guys, and they had blackface, and it was all like melt. It was a really melting pot comedy, so and show business. Well, because accents are fun, and, I, and they and probably yes, and had we'll very. Look at all in the family, like the idea of people using the word malaprops. Is that what's the where you use the wrong word? Mm -hmm. Like that was a big part of early vaudeville was like, oh, I'm saying this word wrong because I'm an immigrant and people are laughing and you're like, oh, we're making fun of the Irish, we're making fun of the Jewish guys. We're making fun. I mean, that's that's all kind of went away. But I still when you were a kid, you there was still vestiges of ethnic humor like that. When I remember there was Polish jokes when I was a kid, that was like a style of joke that people would say even on television i don't know if you're you my might last not be name's polish they still say it to really? me really so yeah yeah it's really interesting and i feel like in a way blonde jokes are like that too it's just like a, a stereotype where you can hang jokes on so what have you guys in your careers noticed about <laughs> things that you had to remove from your act oh, because yeah. it wasn't anymore it it just was no longer going to be acceptable it's about half my act so yeah, really uh, did you have any laughs i had to edit no out. <laughs> it's no it's not half my act but there are things now that it's like especially if you had done something like i used to make fun of uh and this was one of my favorite things to do was when uh the lead singer of journey yeah. left and they replaced him with <laughs> you know Filipino yeah guy. yeah and mm. this guy arnie pineda i know his name <laughs> i know a lot about him because i was he fascinated like him, and this was like probably in the early 2000s when they replaced and and i don't think it really was apparent till a little bit later when they started touring and people saw and um it was just crazy to see him in concert at the hollywood bowl and he doesn't speak a lot you know, and he, 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 you know, and if he says one thing, you're like, the oh, English yeah. English is the lyrics to the journey Exactly. Songs. And so, you know, it's just an observation and it was fun. And, and anytime I did this and I did him singing or whatever, it's just, you know, it's still to this day. It's like. Wait, did you do him with like an accent? Yeah, yeah I can okay, do Because okay. uh, like I'm honorary Filipino, I think it's my beef fry. She's Filipino. And so I've just, I always embraced the culture and whatnot. So, and, and I grew up around like her, her family. And so we would always like do the accent to her mother, whatever. So, but now, you know, me getting up on stage and maybe doing that, I know like for for the Filipino audience members, they would just yeah, they loved. Like I still feel like I could go to the Philippines with that, and everybody would be like, "We love it." But now it's just not even something I'm going to bring out because liberal, I feel like people liberal. would be like, "Oh it's no," you know, like did she just do a Filipino accent and she can't right. do that? And you know, well Seinfeld, interesting. Who is probably the least offensive comedian on the planet? When Seinfeld says, "I don't do colleges anymore because everybody's too politically correct," I knew we had gone over the border. Yeah, too much. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, there was a reason it went too far. I. I don't know. Look, we're in the middle of it, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But that is a really incredible story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, so you just know you don't even want to do that because you're afraid. Not really. Like I said, if I'm if I if I think I'm in front of an all Filipino room, mm -hmm. you bet I'm gonna do that because it's like I'm in. It's you're just, honoring that. I yeah. know what. Yeah. I, but I, the, what does that say to you? Yeah. What does that say to you? That the people that are offended aren't the people that they're they're being offended for somebody else. I guess, but right? I think I think at this moment in time, I mean, I have enough material and, yeah. and I can improvise and work off my feet enough that I don't have to fall back on that. You know, it's already it's already been out there and it's done and I right. don't have to always rely on it. It's just something that I, I always love when I'm working through an audience and mm -hmm. I find someone who's Filipino and I'm like, right. oh, you know, and, it, and there are certain people that they love from their country. Like we love certain people from our country. And that was one of the guys that's really hailed. And they're so, proud of him. Yeah. Right. And they that's, found this him. is the same reason I have not done black 
face for three years now. <laughs> right, right, right. I understand. Well, I, I just cut it out. I don't need it anymore. Ah. It, it offends some people. It's like, all right, that's enough for me. I used to write for Rick Dees, and it was during a time period where, where our friend Steve Bluestein did oh, yeah. uh, a character called Abe from Fairfax. And the people that liked it the best were Jews. I'm Jewish. And then the Anti-Defamation League starts calling up Kiss FM and saying, you know, you can't, uh. you can't do Abe from Fairfax, which is... And I would say Abe isn't every Jew. He's a Jew who lives in Fairfax. And he's fictional. So... <laughs> But yeah, it's like the people from that culture think they, they most identify with it and they're the least outraged as long as you're doing it with love. And I think that's the ingredient that needs to be there. You're not. I know, but this, I feel I know we were talking about love earlier with The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. But I do feel like it's a very nebul nebulous thing to say It's if you're doing it with love. Like some people could say, oh, he's doing it affectionately. And other people could look at the same thing and go like. Oh, he's taking these people down a notch. Yeah, I don't think anyone was doing blackface with love. <laughs> yeah, Rickles got away with it because at the end of the show, he said, you know, I love everybody. Uh, yeah, right, I made right. fun of everybody. <laughs> Esther, he decimated every. Oh, episode. yeah. When I was on a ship in World War II, <laughs> there was no color. It's like, okay, no. Yeah. <laughs> Just embrace your act. Just, yeah. <laughs> right? We enjoyed it. What, okay, so Wayne, we want to hear what jokes you've had to remove within the last I month. haven't really because I'm like, I from that Seinfeld mold of like, I don't really do controversial stuff. I've never, I don't say the F word on stage. And so. Also in this podcast, I guess not. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there hasn't really, I'm trying to think if there was, there was one Let's joke. Let's talk I, about the reason why you do that. Okay. Because okay, I yeah, think that's yeah. an important part of your book as well. Oh. And what, and what um, cable introduced to the comedy mm -hmm. environment because i have a beef with deaf comedy jam oh. not that black comedians finally had a way to show their skills right. but i just thought they changed the expectations of clubs so people came to clubs because you know all bets are off on cable on those deaf comedy jam shows right, right. and so if you work without using profanity like i do you seem tepid to the people in an audience after that well it's a hard it's a you know it's hitting from a high, it's a tougher it's a tougher hill to climb, yeah. definitely. But I think if your material is smart and good, you can do it. Oh, right. And I always think comedy is, and tell me if you disagree with this, like the best comedians, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but the best comedians are the comedians that bring you into their world. So you're like, oh, I'm living here as opposed to, hey, did you know, you know, let, let, let me talk about cornflakes, everything we know, you know, everyone's involved with this. Like, let's go into that. That's why Richard Pryor, and in a way, Deaf Comedy Jam is an outgrowth of what Pryor did in that movie and those records where he'd be very explicit with his language. But he never relied on, that's not what made his- Of course, of course. His yes. humanity that doesn't, what made him uh, Everyone said that. It was like Pryor created a lot of comedians, yeah. a lot of bad. Right. But Pryor and then Eddie Murphy had a big special called Delirious in mm -hmm. 1983. And so if out of there of like, oh, you can say anything and you can say the MF compound word, I don't know if you used it in your act. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so suddenly that became a style of comedy. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, but when we were, it is out. hard to it is hard to follow someone who uses explicit language a lot. But yeah, I've done it. No, no, I, I mean, you yeah. you have to do it, or you won't work in the rooms. Right. But I, but but we we came up in a time when you had to be careful because when you were trying to get booked on The Tonight Show. Right, right. That was... And Macaulay was in the room, or one of these bookers was in the room. You had to work clean, because if you if you swore on stage, even in a club, they wouldn't book you because they didn't trust that you'd be able to work clean right. on Right, that's show. why Sam Kennison is very important in the history of stand-up. Oh, absolutely. Because he was the first comic to break through yeah. without the endorsement of Johnny. Yeah. Without doing that, that moment where you're a Roseanne, or you're, yeah. you know, I mean, Roseanne was there, but... Seinfeld and Gary Shandling and Freddie Prinze and all of those guys. And ultimately, he became so popular they had to put him on the show. Yeah. And he blew Johnny away. Did, right, right, right. I, I, right. God, I thought that sentence him. was going to end with, and then he blew Johnny. <laughs> so then I, just, I was like, oh my God. Cause... That may have happened. Maybe that's what happened. Yeah. in the next book. Well, but there, I have a question for you, Wayne. Did you guys ever hear? Because Sam Kinison was actually one of my inspirations. Oh, I love it. Tell me. And. Did you ever hear the story? I heard this once that he was performing in Vegas and he was so high and he was he was just obliterated that people paid all this money and he came out. I don't know where I heard this story. And he came out, he sat down and he ate a bucket of fried chicken. Yeah, I did hear for that like, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. and then 
people were pissed. Like, that's what he did for his act. I know, because there was a lot of vegetarians in the audience. <laughs> I'm saying you can't, you never know who you're going to offend. But you even, <laughs> no, but I did you, hear that you story. You did hear that. He did was, that story. he was yeah. out of his mind. He was a crazy Yeah, he was crazy. He was a, he was you a, would know him, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. I actually have a very affectionate moment with him. I used to do this TV show called It's Fritz that yeah. came on after Saturday Night Live for three years. And he was a guest. And as a gift, you know, Mitzi used to write the lineup in hand uh, on the paper and hang it on the front door of the comedy store. So he had this sheet that uh, was the lineup on this particular night. And on the lineup was Andrew Dice Clay, Howie Mandel, Fritz Coleman, Sam Kinison, and all these other people. And I said, let's arrange everybody as to tax brackets in this <laughs> thing. But it, 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 he gave it to me framed, uh, and it was the coolest gift I have in my home Interesting, now. no women. Wow. Was no really, women on that list, interesting. He was, he was a, a sad character. Yeah, yeah. But nobody knew how to command an audience, and that was all of his fundamentalist Christian you know, training on stage. Incredible. He was amazing. I, to this day, in my opinion, to, for me, of all people ask me who that that was the funniest at that for a very brief period of time before he went crazy, yeah. comedian because it was so I agree. It was I agree. so it was powerful. So electric, yeah. you, I agree. And this was the thing you felt him. Yeah. You know, you earlier you were talking about the emotion right. as opposed yeah. to just the word. You felt Sam Kennedy. Yeah, it was the kind of energy where I once I, I once here. interviewed. Chris Farley yeah. for for Tommy Boy. I know it wasn't a stand up or whatever. And you know, watching a guy like that in a movie or on TV, it's like, wow, that guy's funny. But try having him sit right here, right. and you're not supposed to be laughing because you're recording an interview. That was the funniest dude I've ever been in the presence of. You don't have to look at me. Too. You don't have to look at me and say that. That's really. <laughs> but it was it was otherworldly. You know, it was like this otherworldly. Anything else? <laughs> This energy that's emanating, and Sam. I get it. He has good energy, and he's funny. <laughs> and Sam, and Sam had that that same intensity. Jesus. It's like this intensity that it's like almost too bright to last. Well, his brother is a is a fundamentalist preacher too, and he ha and he preaches on Facebook. Now. Oh, he does. Yeah, and I worked for he and his wife because they owned a theater in Upland. They just sold it. Oh, it was yeah, a lot of fun. Upland. It was an all. Did, did you ever work there? No, it's but it's fun. It's a redone movie theater, oh. and it's really narrow, but it's really long. It's okay. an odd performance space, but they they grew up in that, and I guess their parents were preachers too. So he learned all that rhythm, and there's a science to that. I love to watch these guys on the the Trinity Channel or something. Mm -hmm. I can't not watch them because they're. As far as commanding a stage and knowing how to manipulate the right. emotions of an audience, yeah, they're so good. There's certain cadences, and yes. then there's certain politicians that have picked up on oh, those cadences and are and that was so oh, yeah. and are abusing people. And, yeah, and, and, no, but I want to before we go close, to where the food is. Go <laughs> to where the food. That was this is funny. I know. Story. I can I just say something real quick. I know yeah. we're wrapping up, but I tried to play that clip to my students at USC. I'm an adjunct they didn't professor. Get it. They thought it was offensive. My, That's where we're at. I right. I I played it for my husband's Brazilian, yeah. and he <laughs>, laughs at the same things I do. I had introduced him actually to Eddie Murphy, Delirious. Oh, really? He had okay. never seen that. Okay. He'd only seen him. You know, he's like, oh, I know him from coming to America. <laughs> and, you know, and, and he just knew him as a character, and he never knew him from SNL, and he never knew him as a stand-up. Mm -hmm. So when I put Delirious, when we were first dating and I put De Delirious, I said, sit down, watch this. He, he thought it was the best thing. He he was like, you're right. This Like, it's still played. Then I just recently played Sam Kinison, and he's like, well, he's not, he's not that good. You know, and I was so surprised because everything that I, I've well, always loved. How did you loved. see How did you see Sam? Like, what did you see him at the... I never board? saw him personally. Oh, I just remember when I would go to Jew camp during the summers, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, this kid from camp would run in playing his tapes. Oh, and okay. so we'd hover around oh, awesome. and we would listen to Sam Kinison and we would just laugh and we thought it was funny. He, he'd bring in Sam Kinison and then he brought in Dice Man. And so, but I never got to be in the same room because I didn't get to the store Different until cat. much later. Yeah, yeah, I'm only 30. No. So, um, photofacial Botox. Anyways, it uh, was a whole. It was a whole thing that that's amazing. you know. I just, but I grew up. He, he was the number one person. So but like you point so out powerful. in your book, yeah, every generation of comedians is a reaction to the generation before. Because I remember when Sam was 
the manager of the Westwood Comedy Tell Store. Me, I and can't. when it was time to do last call and clear the room out, Sam would go up and do his <laughs> act, honest to God, and scare the shit out of people and they would all leave. Well, what had, this is, I'm always, fa- I know we have to go. I'm oh, always nice. fascinated by Sam Kennison from that Sam Kennison that would walk the room to Sam Kennison who could sell out Madison Square Garden or something like What happened from that time in his act that that he became more palatable and that people were like, Oh, this is great. It's cultural. It's against what everybody else is doing. I think it's why Steve Martin was popular, because it was so different from everybody else. It was like a it oh, was like a parody of stand up in itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so it kind of it, it depends no, on No, I meant specifically and did you see anything that changed at Sam's act? Uh, no. Oh, uh, so it's just the audience came to him. No, I think what happens is it's a lot like music. So you want, as a kid, like if you're 15, like at Jew Camp, you want to hear the thing that you're not supposed to be listening to. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, it, it's like this quote. this kind of like window into like this adult culture, <laughs> yeah. and you know, and you want and you want your own version of that. And so it's contraband, and it's like going to oh, be edgy. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I think it was Sam. That's probably a, a, a part of it. I really right. do. Amazing guy. Amazing. Time. So what I want to talk about before we leave is uh, let's review the arc of acceptance regarding social media. Did it mirror the seven stages of grief where comedians <laughs> first accepted that they would burn through material on national TV? But how have they adjusted to tweeting and is it making them stronger writers or are they like precious with their thoughts? Like this is something that I'll tweet, but I'm going to hold on to it for my act and not put it on Twitter. Like. What's been the acceptance arc? Is my funny a renewable resource or is it something that I have to conserve? The yeah. conservative argument is Leno, who will never do a television right. special because he says it eats up his comedy and then he can't do it in the rooms anymore. The other one is the Dane Cook, who says put it on social media. He's the, He was the MySpace guy. Mm-hmm. He's the first comic to generate an audience simply by social media exposure. Am I right about that? You're correct. But, I mean, there was more to him than just the MySpace guy. He was on Comedy Central, and it was like a convergence. But, yes, he, super, he was the one like, oh, this is how you can he knew sell out to- and read it. Yeah, he knew how to harness it, and also he was looking— And he also connected with those fans. He He was looking for girls, let's be honest, but he he was incentivized. all his emails. He was incentivized to kind of harness this new form of connection. But how—like you guys, for example, like how is—what's your social media presence? How much of your funny are you giving away for free? I, I don't mind putting it all out there. You know, I, th- I feel like it's a, a trial and error. And if you put it out there, it doesn't necessarily mean and, and if it works, then you, maybe you try it in the club. And, and when you try it in person, it's a different presentation. Just because I've put a, something that fits into 280 characters into one joke doesn't, you know, that that's not going to represent my whole act or who I am Mm -hmm. and and you can also present it differently I'm you know usually more high energy physical so if you see a one-liner and and personally with like the pandemic when you we had to start doing comedy online that really is what helped hone so thank god for social media or zoom or things like that because it really honed my writing skills to be in front of something so when I did go take it live it, it kind of transformed itself, if that and makes it sense. it keeps you in the public consciousness, even if it's not your funniest right, stuff. Right, right. It keeps people thinking about you. So when it's time you go do a date in that town, people say, oh, let's go. I know her, yeah. How about you, Wayne? What, what, will you tweet jokes or will you just- I don't really tweet many jokes anymore. I, I don't know. I, I don't like being on my phone, so it's like I'm trying to be in the world as much as I can, and so that's sort of my strategy. I do it, I, pro- I use it for promotion mainly. And if somebody tweets something, I'll retweet and I'll, I'll try to, I'm, I'm more of an interactor online than like, here's a funny thought I had about. Yeah, me uh, too. Yeah. Reactionary. That, yeah, I'm very reactionary. But that. you're there taking the pulse of the culture being a teacher. So what are you feeling in the classroom? What, 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 what's making kids laugh? What, you, you said that they were, they're very politically correct now, but what, mm-hmm. what makes them laugh? Who, who, is, who is funny to them? Well, it's a depend. I mean, obviously, the big you know the big ones are like uh, Chappelle is big. Although 
you know, that the one sticks and stones was not well received in my class. I was shocked because I loved it. But it's just uh, my whole thing in my is like I'm going to obviously like different things than my, somebody who's 19 years old. They're born on 9-11. You How's like I mean? Joan Rivers perceived in that class? They barely know. They barely God. know her. They barely mm. know. Her. It's this is this was the shocker for me. It's just it's more about time than about specific things was. To me, an old comedian was like Jackie Green. To them, an old comedian is somebody like Dimitri Martin. <laughs> somebody that their parents might have liked when they were, you know, before they were born. Wow. Wow. You know, that's your parents' comedian yeah. would be a Dimitri. <laughs> to me, he's like a kid. It was like, okay, I got to readjust all of <laughs> yeah. this. Plus, we're, we're in a consumer I love it. I'm society. practically dead to your <laughs> right, class, right. huh? Uh, I was, yeah, oh. it was really shocking. People consume stuff and spit it out faster now. So Oh, it flips the, over the arc, so quickly. Yeah, the arc of somebody's career. But can I say thing. something? Right at the end of my book, I write about two uh, comedians that got discovered over the pandemic, and that was Sarah Cooper, who yeah. did that... Uh, lip sync mm -hmm. to Donald Trump. Yeah, and but what you taught me is she was a lip synker before she started lip syncing Trump. Like, yeah, that but she also her... did comedy as well, but she, okay. that was one of the things she did. And then uh, Z-Way, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, and she, she's on, uh, she has a Showtime, like she, Showtime's variety show now that just got picked up. And she used to do, exactly what we know we were talking about, she used to do a weekly talk show on Instagram Live. And that's got popular. People started tuning into it six o'clock on a Thursday night or whatever it was, and that's how she got discovered. Well, before, interesting, right? After we after we do our closing credits, yeah. Or uh, before we do our closing credits, where can people find you online? Just at Fetterman on Twitter and at my website WayneFetterman.com. Nothing crazy. It's Nothing a fantastic crazy. book. I, I mean, if you're uh, a fan thanks, of stand -up, brother. Because I don't think people uh, understand how far back the art of standing on a stage trying to get laughs alone goes back, and it's really interesting. Thank you. And good, Sean good Polofsky, who's one just, of the funniest people I think ever. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My favorite comedian. <laughs> what, what are you guys all drinking? I love uh, you too no, so much. And so I love nice. and, and so Sean fast. is so one nice. of those yeah, people that even if you've seen her a hundred times, you're gonna watch her again she does and go voices. that joke again. <laughs> she does voices. <laughs> I read that on Twitter. Do something new. <laughs> And I, I, I ride in cars with Sean to gigs, and I tell her what I'd like to see her do. So <laughs> I love you, Weezy. It's nice to have that uh, kind of control. The spelling bee, of course, as you know, is my favorite. I haven't done that. You know, I know. someone told me, did I tell you this? What? My spelling bee bit, which I have not done in a long time, <laughs> what happened is I used to do this long-winded spelling bee Was it a closer? Bit, and it wasn't a closer. <laughs> just a bit. It was just a bit. Okay. making the, fun of a, children. Of no, the I love ESPN it. spelling bee oh, competition. I and I did this like 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened is I get a call, and maybe it was like four years ago, and it was uh, Grace and Frankie, right? That's the show. Oh, so my wow. friend said, Sean, your spelling bee bit is on Great, they just did it. And I'm like, what? And he's like, somebody, somebody saw this. And I'm right. like, it's like 12 years ago. So that was really weird. And then when the spelling bee competition just recently happened and there was a like a young African-American girl that won the whole thing, then people, my sisters called up and they're like, you know, and I, I was at my like niece's engagement party and they're like, you got to do the spelling bee bit. And it was like a whole party of people. And I was like, this is uncomfortable. I'm not doing the, to a bunch of rich white people in New Orleans. Like, no. So, yeah, the spelling bee bit had I couldn't even re there. I couldn't even remember. How does it go? Yeah. It took me a I moment to, to bring it back. That happens to me, too, where people are like, do the sit and sleep. <laughs> like I maybe did yeah. that joke once to see if it was yes. anything, and it's not anything. <laughs> yes. It's still nothing. Yes. But, uh, yes. So after we do the closing credits, and yeah. Fritz tells you how to subscribe, then I have like a true Hollywood fact, and that's Wayne and I used to be in a band together. What? And so yeah, over the closing credits, we're gonna play. Yeah, I love it. You know the <laughs> the, the gig. <gasps> and, oh. Oh yeah. There's me on drums. That's and the right. Swish. So yeah, we see in the swish because I was an early adopter of podcasting and YouTube. So this, what's the date on this, Thomas? Before you get into this, we have to have these guys back because there's so much I want to talk to Wayne about. No, he I needs to come about, back. You both. Need I know to come back. you have to come back. You guys were awesome. Okay, we'll but I want to. I want to come about, back together because I yeah, feel like we're yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got to no. write a book. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> no, I won't no, come back until I, mean, I write I a book. I want to talk about radio and how it was when people could hear the humor but not see the person oh, doing yeah. it. And how that changed everything. There's a lots of cool stuff to talk about. I believe now it's called Clubhouse.
Clubhouse? What is that? I don't know. It's radio. It's <laughs> it's a it's a new social media app, and it, it it got really popular around like right after the insurrection, and so it's oh. it's actually the radio version of it's it's um it, it you could say look, podcasters and people use it but people have developed a lot of fun shows and you can't you can see people's little profile pictures like you can on instagram in a room all at once but you can't you, you can't like yeah, interact like with anybody except mm-hmm. like raise your hand to talk to the people who you're listening to so it's all audible i'm oh. so out of the loop i'm so it's, it, it's relatively new it's relatively oh my new. god but it is huge and i do know there's I just heard of a comedian who was opening for, I can't remember who it was, who was like, got their opening act f- from Clubhouse. All right, Fritz, where can people find us online and, and write? Well, all the things, all the you know, places you find stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you look Apple for Media Podcast. Path Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, it would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners if you leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. You're going to find lots of binge-worthy stuff. Bill Medley, Mark Summers, Wayne Fetterman, Richard Sturman of the Oak Ridge Boys, the Livingston Brothers from My Three Sons, Diane Warren, Tony Dow, who's in the hospital with pneumonia. We have to send him a card or something. Tony. And uh, Sean Polofsky. Sean Polofsky, (laughs) Gary Puckett, the Kalsas, Olga Henry Winkler, Keith Morrison. Going back to the very beginning, listen, thank you for spending an hour with us and we would be overjoyed if you took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> I'll do that. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter where we are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guests, Sean Polofsky and Wayne Fetterman. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. Our theme music is Journals by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. top i think it was christmas look the we same were, we were playing do you, do you sleep in a, a, a an ice chain 2006 I interesting do. like doesn't we like it's kind of crazy no, she, does, she does she does she does well, wayne looks the same too it's, exactly it's kind of nuts i'm gray i'm gray this is the same room what you do you guys i think you're wearing the same shirt too <laughs> you guys look the same same room this room's had many lives it's had more it lives than room? shirley mcclain I don't remember that. Well, that was a really old reference right there. Thank you. That is early podcast. It was 2006. That's right at the start of it. Yeah, I just heard a podcast, and I went up to Laura, Laura Fisher, at, a, at, a, at an open mic, or as you call them, mics. Right. And I said, have you heard a podcast? And she said, yeah, I just heard about it yesterday. And I was like, let's do one. She's running a whole company. I know. What company is that called? My manager called me and goes, Laura wants to bring your Maximum show. Maximum fun. Yeah. And I was like, the swish? The swish? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, the swish? What, so she nice. She a podcasting company or what? She she's works working. at Maximum Fun, which is a huge she's podcasting like, company. Yeah. Oh, good for her. And they have all kinds of original programming. That that was was awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me.